Ah, pleasant good morning to one now. Pleasant good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Wednesday's episode of Speaking Out, Exposing Corruption and Incompetence. Today, Wednesday, the 27th day of March, 2024. Welcome one and all. Hope you had a good um, night. Hope um, since we last met on Monday that you had a good Pagwa day and that you are very restful and ready to go. So welcome one and all. Share the live. Share the live. Let them know that you're here. School um, this uh, this morning, schoolyard pack, man. The schoolyard pack. Uh, people just waiting anxiously, I suppose, for us to get started. We're going to be with you in a short while. I was just share the live and give us our thumbs up. Show your appreciation. All we are asking you to do when you come on, give us a thumbs up. And we are going to be encouraged. We're going to make sure that we are here to bring you the valid, credible, truthful information. So welcome to this Wednesday's episode. Um, my colleague, Mr. Conway, is already in the studio. And again, we have so many things to tell you this morning. Uh, what we're going to do, as is usual, we're going to do the roll call, and we're going to roll into the subject. But you know, we have to give this preamble, so we give everyone an opportunity to join, including those who are going to take notes to report to the minister and to report to other government functionaries. We, want to, you, we don't want you to misrepresent us. Take the notes and report uh, accurately. As we would say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Let's give praise and thanks to being in the land of the living. It's a privilege to be able to get up in the morning to see a new dawn. Many persons would not have been this fortunate. So we must always give praise and thanks, especially in this week. I forgot to mention when we met on Monday, on Monday that this week is um, what we call in the in, on the Christian calendar Holy Week. This is the week leading up to Good Friday, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Sunday was Palm Sunday. Um, today, today is a very significant day, the Wednesday in Holy Week. Let me tell you, I made a note, um, the Wednesday in, in Holy Week, uh, this, is the, this is today, the Wednesday, when a disciple by the name of Judas Iscariot betrayed Christ for um, well, they said 30 pieces of silver or something like that. For pieces of silver, it was the Wednesday before Good Friday that that um, took place. Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus Christ on the Wednesday. So for us Christians and for the many Christians who are here, I, I'm sure that you are looking forward to Good Friday, um, that crucifixion day, which is celebrated. And then Sunday really is Easter, and well, then the risen, um, the, the rising rather of the of Jesus Christ, and then we celebrate it in Guyana, in particular on the the Monday, Good Friday, the Friday coming. That is one of the worst days to me as a little boy growing up, because that, that occurred in the midst of your kite making activity. I had a nice little side also where you used to make kites and sell in the village. Well, I was very good at it, but this Good Friday now. You have to go to church. That long, 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 long service. And one of the things I remember most about Good Friday, you can't eat meat. No meat. If no meat is prepared, you get a little varmazelli, or you get a little um, callaloo, a little thing. No meat. You can't eat meat. You can't eat during the course of the day. It was still down in the afternoon. So Good Friday is the day, apart from it cutting up my little kite runnings, the fact that you ain't getting your, your, your meat um, to eat uh, was something that I never look forward to. Then church at a long service. It's a long service. All you could think about is your kite and the rumbling of your stomach. So yeah, this is the week with Friday. So let's give praise and thanks for being here. And um, let's say again, again, it's always a privilege to be uh, to get up and to see a new dawn. We're going to tell you about so many persons who during the course of this week would not have been this fortunate. So many, many uh, individuals, children, adults, young persons, sad, 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 sad. So yeah, share the life, share the life. And I'm not, we're not getting the thumbs up. Give us the thumbs up and share the life. This morning, the program was scheduled around um, nine o'clock, just after nine. And immediately, people in the schoolyard, immediately people in the schoolyard. And I must choose this opportunity to tell you again, to subscribe to the channel, go to YouTube, subscribe. Go to Facebook and like the page. So you're going to get the notification 
when we go live. Whether we go early, whether we go later, you're going to get the notification uh, when we go live, and also you will help popularize uh, the channel. Many of you have done so. I note that many of you, on the re some regulars, I can see it, some regulars have not subscribed. Even though you're here every day, this class, you're present, but you have not gone to the YouTube channel and hit the subscribe and the notification button. So please do that um, without any delay. When we went live this morning, the first person in the house was from the UK, Wayne Little. Congratulations, Wayne. He was the first student in the schoolyard this morning. Then we had Joan, followed by Earl. Sean. Sean is very much here. John. John, this was nice seeing you recently, my brother. Nice seeing you and be able to put a face to the name. Then we had Floyd, came in from Brooklyn, Brooklyn in the house. Vibart, the man from the East Bank. And he reminds us that the motto is one people, one nation, one destiny. That is Guyana's uh, national motto. Then we have my squad mate out of Canada, Gaston, is in the house. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little later. So many buses and motorcycles who died over the past week or so. Lynette from the UK is in the house. Winston. And Winston is all the way from California. Lucius is here. Tilula, he's normally from Brooklyn. He would say Brooklyn. Then we have Jakey. Jakey is from Baltimore. Vivian is in the house. Carl, my squad mate from Arizona, is very much here. Then we have Kerry. Uh, she's from the from east coast of Demerara, my uh, area. Then Kenneth is in the house. Maryland. Lawrence is um, there. Anthony, K, Trati is here. Winston Otter from the UK is in the house. Evelyn, then we have um, Ronald, Magnell, Francis Keith from Melanie Damashana, Fogus, Terence from Canada, 9795 was his regulation number. Then we have Sandra. Here, she said greetings, Desiree, and Desiree is from Georgia. Welcome, Desiree. Cranston, then we have um, Morton, Princess Hall from Lamar Springs. Carol, Carville, my squad mate. Isabella is here. Uh, Tessa High from Florida. Clay, Gordon, um, Barbara. And Barbara says that she, uh, sorry, Patricia came in next, and Patricia said, that she missed lectures and mon lectures and Monday, but she's vacationing and she is waiting for the class to commence. So um, welcome, welcome, enjoy your vacation. I hope we make it even better when we bring you some news, not necessarily because some of the news is really distressing news. Pauline is here. Brian, uh, Danny, Danny, we wish you, um, I understand that you're not enjoying the best of health, my brother. Wish you a speedy recovery. Vibart is in the house. Daniel is here. Courtney, Camille, Aileen, the female cricket umpire. Clarence, Denise, and Denise is from Florida. Michael Brower, the, the squatters, uh, um, squad mate. He's from the British Virgin Islands. Then Doreen, my squad mate from Canada. Bart is here. Carlton, another squad mate of mine, 9430. Emerson. He's in Manhattan, Midtown Manhattan. Lyndon, Lyndon is here. Stanley Tong, New Amsterdam, he in the house. Carlisle. Then we have uh, Evelina, Evelina. Albert, can't recall seeing Albert before, so welcome, Albert. Elsie uh, is here. The one and only, Elsie uh, is in the house. Then the one and only BX is here. George um, is in the house. Monica. Rhonda, Anthony from Peter's Hall in the East Bank of Demerara, Clive from the UK, Patricia from uh, New Jersey is here, Felicia, Jaco from Georgia, May or me or whatever is how you pronounce it is in the house from Brooklyn, Terence from California is here, Family Music, Everett, Everett is all the way from Texas. And he talking about we're gonna to touch on it this morning. He wants to know if you have any information, but we're gonna talk about it. Bonita from West Coast Barbies, Queenie from Brooklyn, Marlon 
is here. Can't recall seeing Marlon before. We welcome my brother. Ron is here. Cecile. Uh, Como is very much here. Uh, Terence. Welcome, Terence. Karen. Anne. David. Maureen is here. Um, after Maureen, Gordon. Old Police 6659 out of Canada is here. Brenda. Grace is in the house. Uh, Malcolm. Taden. Then we have Sharwin, Kevin, Denise, the secretary is here, Sandrine, Johnny, Melissa, John with a punch, uh, Rastaman is here, John, Alex John Rogers is here, Dexter is in the house, and um, Dexter says, good, good to be in the land of the living, Sheena, Ether is here, then we have Glendis, uh, Tarza, one, two, three, six. I can't recall seeing Tarza before. Welcome, welcome. And he says, um, tell us to continue to keep the diaspora informed. I will look forward to hearing from you. And then we have the one and only Selwyn, our attorney. Find some time to tune in to us this morning. Welcome, Selwyn. Troy, Ulrich, and Troy is from uh, Tor um, Toronto. Ulrich, my squad mate, operating out of Barbados. Clay, Joseph, uh, Ward. Walterine, then we have Colin from Queens, V. John, not B. John, B. John is what um, Nandala they call me, Bajan, but V. John is in the house, Denise is very much here, and then Vibert, Smitty is here, um, the, 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 the person. Then we got, when we went live, we have Raul, Altia, um, Edward, Brandy, and the list goes on. We have Lynette out of Barbados, and the list goes on and on and on. Let me bring in Mr. Con Before I bring in Mr. Conway, let me make some quick announcements, and then I'm going to bring Mr. Conway in. Now, the first announcement I want to make, I did tell you some time ago about the death of my squad mate, 93, 98, Tony Favorite. Well, he is going to be buried on Saturday. Um, the information is there will be a service at the Merriman's funeral home from 11.30 to 1.30. Then he goes to his residence at Roxanne Borden Gardens and then for burial. And Wake will be held as his residence tomorrow night, tomorrow Thursday night. That is my squad mate. He was known as the Puri Man, Tony favorite. And then we have to announce regretfully the death of, an, of ex sergeant 6599, Jameson Renshaw Alexander. Jameson Renshaw Alexander, ex sergeant. 6559. He died, they said, on the 17th of March in the USA, and the funeral will take place on the USA on the 30th. That is Saturday, the 30th. Also, the death of ex um, traffic sergeant 6610, Frankie Worrell, who died on the 18th of March in the USA. I remember Frankie Worrell very well. I'm sure Vibert, who is here the last time, will remember Frankie when I joined the force as a special constable in 1973. At Sparnam, Frankie Worrell, 6610, was one of the traffic corporals, or he was the traffic corporal there. Traffic sergeant was 5349 Alexander. And you had um, 5200 combat as the station sergeant. Stalwarts like Ulrich Landon, Thomas Bizet, Morris Roberts, all of those persons were there. So I remember Frankie Worrell very well, and he played cricket. And he was a cricketer. He had a little bow foot, and he played cricket. Well, we got news, I got news yesterday that Frankie has passed. I want to take this opportunity to, um, to to express condolences to the relatives, friends of all the deceased uh, person. Let me bring in Mr. Conway, and then we're going to continue to make some announcements. Mr. Conway, uh, welcome. Hope you had a wonderful evening, and if you're looking forward to a productive day. So true, so true. I'm happy to be in the land of the living. Um, condolences to those persons who pass away. I can remember Frankie Warrell well, but I remember him, I think he was a sergeant then. And I, pay, I played a, a little bit of cricket for the East Coast police team. I wasn't no water, but I think I kept wicket. I can't remember seeing you on the team, Paul. And also I want to send out belated birthday greetings to 13363 Corporal Paul Sandy. Uh, when I was the commandant for the Felix Austin Police College B Division, I think they changed up the name now. Uh, she, uh, she used to triple up as a quartermaster. 
as a librarian and as a secretary. I understand she celebrated her sixth Edward Day recently, and she flew all the way to Jamaica to Ocho Reyes. We understand she had a wonderful five days. Congratulations, Paula, and there are many more candles to blow out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so in terms of board day too, today is the board day of retired woman inspector, Deborah Small. Smalley, well, uh, happy board day to you, uh, my dear. Happy, happy board day uh, to you. Hope you have a wonderful day. And then, you know, as I said, we, we mentioned on Monday that um, over two weeks, we haven't heard anything more about the death of Sergeant Vaughn. Remember, Sergeant, the police sergeant who was shot and killed, they said by accident by one of his colleagues. Nothing more. Nothing more up to now. We have not heard from the police. Accidental uh, death. They said three shots. That is what we learned. And um, police can't give any follow-up up to now. So real, 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 real sad. And then we had the tragic news. I think I got it last evening. That three children in Region 9... That is the Latem area. Drunk. They died by drunken. Three of them. Um, I mean, that is so, 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 so sad. Three children lost their lives. They said they went to swim in a pond. And then um, when the adults looked a little later, they found their bodies floating. That is what the report is saying. Three young children. I think they were nine, five, and six something. Some age range um, between them. Some eight, nine, six, and five years in the Rupununi at Masara. Three girls drunk at Masara in the Rupununi region. Nine, they were girls who were nine, six, and five years old. That is so tragic. That is so tragic. And then talking about deaths, I saw the editorial in Starbucks News this morning. They were talking about the number of road deaths we have had over the past week or so number a large number of um road deaths and let me tell you what they're saying fatal accidents and some of them police will call them incidents but what we're saying people died on the road whether you want to call it an accident or an incident over the past few days motorcyclists in part in, 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 in um in particular the first one i have to announce here it says a security supervisor died in a motorcycle accident, and his name is Conal Osborns, involved in an accident involving a car and a motorcycle at Cummings and Church Street. Cummings and Church Street, that is recently he died. Then you have a biker die at Wawenta, 20-year-old Asim Gulam, died after being involved in an accident at the Wawenta Public Road, not Rupununi, Region 9. Then you have a teen biker dies after crashing into a GPL pole, Bushlap, on the quarantine, and he is 17 year old Karan du, um, Duham. Dead at Hibernia. Man dies after losing control of motorcycle. 26 year old man, Dennis Williams of Hibernia, Region 2. Then after that, we had one where a Develum man dies after he was run over by a car. This is a 20 year old Warren Thomas, run over by a car and died. And then Camp Street. The, the, the report says the Camp Street accident victim succumbs to injuries. This is Tamika Kerr, 28 of 377 Charles Street. One of the persons injured in an accident on February the 25th. This accident happened February the 25th at the intersection of Camp Street and Brigdam. And the, she succumbed to her injuries on March the 24th. The accident involved the vehicle which was owned and driven by car and a motor lorry. A camp and break down. That is just two corners away from the police station. And then you have a Bartica biker dies after crashing into a bridge. Daniel Anthony Lopes, 22 years old, he lost control, crashed into a bridge, and he died. And then it was only yesterday, only last night, it's been reported that a Sophia biker succumbed in breakdown collision. He had some collision in breakdown with a minibus, and he died. These are all over the past couple of days. All these, except for the one that occurred in February, and the person succumbed on the 24th. So many road accidents. So many road accidents. And you're not hearing anything. What the plans are, in, in the light of all of this, at a recent police officers' conference, the man who sits in the commissioner's chair, Clifton Akin, will be referred to as the, as the 
squatter, extended squatter. He told the conference, and he told by extension the nation and the world, that the focus of the police is on cybercrime and social media influencers. Imagine that. So many persons are dying on the road. And you know, they had a campaign, what they call Respect the Road. So I wonder what happened to that campaign. I think it was launched sometime last, last year or even before that. Respect the Road. What has happened to that campaign? You recall when the campaign was launched? When the campaign was launched, there was a big billboard. This is what they look at it. A big billboard. This is why they rang about at the at Kitty rang about there by the pump station. Big. This is what um, the respect the road. Big picture with the acting commissioner telling people respect the road. And I ask the question then: How is this going to impact on the lawlessness on the road? The picture. This is this is real. Um, I, I I don't know how to describe it, but this is what we had. However, I am um, I have noted that in recent weeks, the picture, this billboard has been removed. It has been replaced by one of the president. That is that the roundabout by, um, by the, the, the pump station there at Kitty. So this is what, this is one of the initiatives they had to reduce accidents on the road, make billboards. I recall seeing one um, somewhere at Windsor Forest on the west coast of Demerara as well. And I asked a question, I haven't gotten an answer yet, how is this going to impact in a positive way on the carnage that is taking place on the roads in Guyana? Oh, and I wonder how much money was spent to, 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 to manufacture and erect this and the similar billboards around the country. I wonder how much, how much money they would have spent. So this is what you had. And then I recall too on the um, New Year's message given by the president, this year, that's the New Year's message of um, January 1st, 2024. The president made a statement. Let me read it. I don't want to um, misquote them. He's quoted a saying, and this is the uh, DPI, Department of Public Information, quoted the president in his New Year's message as saying, um, the carnage on our roads will be greeted with a robust road safety and traffic management plan. I intend to have a national conversation on this issue within the coming days. Out of that conversation, new laws, regulations, and technology will be implemented to stop the carnage on our roads. That was 1st of January, 2024. Today is the 27th of March, um, 2024. Almost three months have passed since that promise to the nation of um, uh, intent to have a national conversation on this issue within the coming days. Now we have coming weeks, coming months all past, and we're not hearing anything more uh, about that. But that is the way these people operate, not win. They come out with a lot of propaganda, a lot of fluff. They say all manner of things. And when you check it out, there is no uh, follow-up, no follow-up. So let me give Mr. Conway to make his comment on that. I have something more to say on this whole traffic issue. But let me give Mr. Conway a chance to say something now. Mr. Conway, I'm sure you would have seen the death of these children and the deaths on the roads, uh, the continued carnage on the roads. Your, your comments, please. Yeah, the, the deaths on the road continue unabated. And all we're getting is talks and talks and talks. The president talked about national conversation. And then in the same breath, he said what would be done. So there was no need, as, as far as I'm concerned, for any national conversation. But unless they have an holistic approach towards this traffic situation, the carnage will continue. It will continue, and, and it's not. To, and it's not. I'm really in in one division. It's countrywide. It's in the Rupanoni. It is in Borbis East Coast. All about the place where they're using road. It is continuing, and no effort is being made. They bring a new a new traffic chief, and 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 and, and it's the same thing. Because they're not they're not addressing the situation, and they're not addressing the the the, the major C, the six C, and that is corruption. Persons are getting their driver's license too easily. Persons never go being a steering wheel, and they get in and they get get the driver's license. You pay a certain amount of money, and you get your competence, and you go to GRA, and you get your driver's license. And when you look at it. Very poor, very few persons are doing the practical examinations 
And when you go to the GRE, you see it flock up with people with, with, with competence. Pay, pay a, a couple of dollars and you get your driver's license. And that's why they get what, what is, and the, the whole thing for me yeah, is that the action is supposed to be data driven. I call it 3D data driven decision. They have to get a database and based on what is happening, they utilize the human and other resources to deal with, 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 this, with this situation. Use the data, but they're cocking the figures. They go thin. They say, hey, it's not traffic accident, it's, it's incident, but persons are dying. Persons are dying. And unless they have a, a holistic approach, unless they're serious about it, unless they, they address the major thing, um, the, the corruption, if they don't address corruption, more drivers will go on the road. I remember one thing who, who, who was in charge of the audit and inspection unit did a report and he said over 1,000, I think 150 some persons got their driver's license illegally and no effort has been made to really track them down. It might be interesting to see those, those, those bikers who died, check and see how they obtained their driver's license. If there's no holistic approach to it, things will continue to happen. West Demoraro is the, de the, the deadliest roads in the country. They are at West Demoraro, and we see no action being taken. The other day, the traffic, the traffic man across the say they they targeting nice nuisance, targeting nice nuisance on the deadliest roads in Guyana. Man, un unless they do things holistically the situation will continue. I agree with you. It requires a comprehensive review. And we have said before this piecemeal thing that they are doing, it's not going to work. It is not going to work. They they say um, speeding is one of the major causes. What are they doing to address that? Driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, um, another major issue. What are they doing to address those issues? What are they doing? I had, there's, a, there's an incident uh, recently too, I read, and, and you know, it, it, uh, it caused me to wonder. They're saying in one of these accidents, one of the drivers was tested um, for alcohol, and he was not above the legal limit. And then what they went on to say, they could not test the female who was injured because she was injured at the time, so couldn't test. What happened to blood alcohol test? Yeah, you're testing breath with the breathalyzer, but they are there. They, you can also do uh, blood tests to determine. So, because she might not be, have been able to give a sample, they are saying the police are saying that they couldn't conduct this um, alcohol test and dispose. And that is part of the problem. That is part of the problem. We made the point over and over that you have to do, if you're talking, if you're saying people are driving under the influence, you have to have SOPs which comply with the law of Guyana. And that is a big problem you have. They put together some things and they don't comply with the law so that when people challenge it in court, it gone, it gone through the window. It gone through the window. And I, I made the point that the standing order, we drafted the standing order, that this random check that you're talking about, you stop in a man and tell a routine check and random check, that, that, that is not permitted under the law. No random check. You have to have reasonable cause to stop a person. Reasonable cause. I cannot random thing. But again, you still see police on the road telling it's a routine check. It's a random check. What is that? Where is that provided for under the law? And that is this is where the training comes in. And I would have expected the attorney general and all these legal minds you have there will draft something, build on what is there. Is not creating the wheel, build on what is there, and let the policemen be properly trained to deal with this issue. Because as we have seen, persons who are charged with driving under the influence of alcohol when they use the breathalyzer test, once it is challenged, once that is challenged, people being not guilty and challenged, the cases are gone. The cases are gone because the, the instruments are not properly calibrated. The police are not properly trained to give the evidence. I did a standing or we did. I did something which was incorporated into the review of the standing order we did. And we spelled out what should happen in keeping with the law. I mean, people talk about these people getting off, people killing people on the road and getting off. Um, even when at the time of the accident, they are found to be driving under the influence or they are above the legal limit. 
let me say that. But when they go to court and, and the, the person goes into the witness box, on the cross-examining, a cross-examination, the case falls apart. And that would be enough reason for the police to sit down, draft something proper. As I did, it is there. You ain't got to pay me. It is there in the system. I know that. It is there. If you want to improve, if you believe it is not um, adequate for what is going on today, improve on it. Improve. But you have the, the blueprint there. Policemen are going. They're giving the breathalyzer test. And when you go to court, you challenge it. The case gone. The case gone because I have made the point that when you are going to use the breathalyzer machine, you have to prove that this machine was properly calibrated. You have to get experts to say the individual machine, this particular machine by serial number that was used. You can't come and give any blanket evidence about breathalyzer machine. Yeah, the court is not going to take judicial notice of the fact that breathalyzer machines were calculated. The court will be interested in the particular machine that was used on this particular person. So once you administer the test, what efforts you make to secure that as evidence all of these are in the, the, um, the, the standing order, the, the draft standing order. All that we prepared. How to give the evidence? Who has to give the evidence about the calibration of the um, specific machine? And I'm saying this again to tell them that unless you do that, unless you do that, unless you train the ranks to do that, the cases are going to continue to fall apart. The cases are going to continue to fall apart. And it is sad because, as we have seen, people are dying on the road. And one would have thought that given the number of deaths, that would have served as an impetus for the government, the Minister of Home Affairs, the Commissioner, the Traffic Chief, and all of these people to bring in people who have some knowledge and understanding. Not me. I am personal and grata. Not Mr. Conway. We are personal and grata. We have other people around who I believe can contribute meaningfully to, to, to this. And as Mr. Conway say wants to do that, then you have to address that 6C. That 6C, which is corruption, you have to address that. You have to address. And we talk too about the breath test, and we talk about the breath analysis. The breath test and the breath analysis. And I would have thought they would have looked at the law and they would have moved to get this done. When you hear the president in a New Year message saying to the nation, that in a few days' time, he is going to, um, what do you say? In a few days' time, in the coming days, you're going to have a conversation about the traffic lawlessness. That was on the 1st of January 2024. In the coming days, well, I guess, if you look technically, technically, you could say that um, the days are still coming. Technically. But that was on the 1st of January, today is the 27th of March, and we have not heard anything for them. And therefore, don't be surprised that the carnage continues. Do not be surprised that the carnage on the roads um, will continue. But it is sad that when you look at the age of these persons, young people, 17, 20, 21, people in the, in the more productive years are being snuffed out. The lives are being snuffed out unnecessarily on the roads um, in Guyana. And I made the point before, and let me repeat it here. This should not be viewed in isolation. These things are occurring in an atmosphere of lawlessness throughout the country, an atmosphere of lawlessness. And many of the politicians, as we will discuss later, are the most lawless that we have. The politicians, that is the example that they set. So when you see people driving carelessly, yeah, it's not good to do that. Or recklessly, not only carelessly, wanton driving, reckless driving, it's part of a of the environment of lawlessness. Go on any road in Guyana. Look at any sphere of our activity, anything in the life. You're going to see lawlessness. Everything you're going to see lawlessness, and therefore the, 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 the manifestation in deaths is one part. But you have a lot of other parts as well. Lots of other parts. Let me bring in Mr. Conway to say something more on this, and then we're going to move on. Mr. Conway, I'm sure you want to say something more on these accidents. I'm not sure, you know. They are there, the annual police officers' conference. And what about the day they had any conference statement? We didn't know what was discussed. I don't know if traffic was discussed because I listened to the extended squad, and in terms of the traffic situation, he, he made one simple statement, one one sentence, he said. 
he said there were less traffic accidents and more deaths. And then he moved on to, to something else. A serious thing like traffic, we expected that even coming out of that of this conference where you have all, all the brains there, that they should have come out with a plan, a plan to deal with the lawlessness on our roads, but nothing. They, perhaps they, they maybe they, they, they more, more lawless than what's, what's going on the road. Things are, persons are dying, dying regularly and coming out, nothing coming out of the officers' conference and they say they want, they're looking for partnerships. Come out with a plan. Let the public know what is your plan if you want support. You can't get support if they don't know what, 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 what you intend to do. And, and that is where we are. No plan, no holistic plan to deal with the traffic situation. Well, the squatter did, he had a plan, if you recall, um, sometime last year, he removed, they changed the traffic chief and they changed every one of the traffic officers in the division. They were ordered to um, line the roads to, to prevent speeding. In other words, they were instructed to have policemen line all the roads in Guyana to prevent um, speeding. They were, and, and that, that was the type of thing that they did. The billboard we talked about. So it is clear that these people don't have a clue as to what they should do to try to bring this situation under control. I mean, in today's editorial in um, um, Sabrook News, they pointed out that the police alone cannot do it. And I agree, we have said this all along. Police alone can't do it. But you have to, the government uh, has a responsibility to put systems and, and uh, things in place to try to deal with this. But to sit back and to tell us you're going to have a conversation within a few days and months down the road, there's no conversation. And we, the public, are not aware of what is being done in terms of education, in terms of enforcement, nothing. Early uh, last year, I think it was, or early, last year, yes, they published the names of a whole set of vehicles that are exceeding the speed limit. To what end? To what end? They talk about, they used to tell us about the number of traffic tickets issued. Again, as this has any significant uh, impact on the carnage and on the road, they, they're publishing these figures. Oh, we issued so many traffic tickets during the course of the week. And I said that the old traffic ticket system has broken down. So if you issue a ticket and the person does not pay, you don't have any means of knowing that the person does not pay or the person did not pay. And then what you have to, every couple of morning, you see the corporate propaganda unit uh, publish some traffic ground talking to some drivers or talking to and they do lectures. They did lectures to drivers, lectures to school. That is the extent to, to, to which they have been um, going to, to give the impression that something is being done. But the evidence suggests, the empirical evidence suggests that it does not add any impact on the carnage on the road. And I want to again express condolences to the relatives, friends of all those deceased persons. And I am saying that we are the ones who should come out and call on the authorities, demand that the authorities let us know what they intend to do to reduce the carnage on the road. We, they, we, we should, we as citizens should demand that the president come out with a statement on the 4th of January, and then after months you don't see nothing and you stay quiet. That should not be, that should not be. We, the citizens, should demand, should demand that action be taken to, um, to arrest this nonsense that is going on. And we, each, about, each and every one of us, has a responsibility to drive carefully, to use the road in a responsible manner. We have the responsibility, yes, but the law enforcement officials, they too have a responsibility to enforce the law. The education official has a responsibility to make sure um, that the, the people are educated on how to use the road. The people from the, the, the ministry, have to ensure that the engineering aspect is there. It's, it's a comprehensive uh, program that you have to have. Comprehensive. Not the police on the road up to date. In this modern time, you see the um, person picture, police marking pedestrian crossing. Policemen, police drawing, marking thing on the road. In this modern era, that is what is going on. That is why I'm talking about that. That brings me straight into another issue, which I saw a very disturbing issue, I must add. Somebody sent to me last night a short video. I'm going to show it in a short while. There, 
a traffic rank was interacting with a driver. Don't know what the reason whether he was stopped and so on. But let me show you, and then I'm going to explain what um, transpired. They're going to show you the short video, and then you're going to see um, what. Um, let me see. Let me find it and, and show it to you. Here it is. Look at it. I'm going to show it once or twice because it's fairly short. <laughs> All right, I don't know exactly what transpired here, but what was told to me is that the traffic rank was rebuking. I think he was a little agitated, rebuking the driver for some mistake. And they had this exchange. And the driver, I'm going to show it to you again, the driver, I, I ain't going to use proper language here. The driver spit on the traffic rank. That is what you see. That is what led to the traffic rank trying to get him out of the car. The driver spat, he spit on the traffic ramp. Let me show let me show you that again. Let me say this. Let me say this. That is totally unacceptable. Mass paper on the police. And I said to the person who sent the thing to me last night that, look, I don't condone unprofessional action on behalf of the police in particular. But we are all human beings. And I'm saying if I'm doing my duty on the road, directing traffic, and a man spit upon me, but I can forget all the professional training that I have. Trust me. It's going to be a natural reaction. And I'm saying that that man who spat on the policeman there in uniform, lucky he still get teeth in him out. Y'all don't accuse me of um, advocating violence. All I'm saying that if I am standing on the road performing my duty, and a man, whatever the circumstances might be, and a driver decides he can spit on me, I can forget all the professional training that I have had. And I'm going to deal with him in the manner he deserves to be dealt with. And if he has to visit the dentist thereafter, that is it. Even if I got to lose the job, that is all about me. Because I'm not going to stand back there or sit, stand up there and allow a driver to spit upon me. I mean, uniform at that. And I'm saying that if the policeman had done anything wrong, then the driver should have gone and made, make a complaint. But to spit on the policeman in uniform is totally unacceptable. I understand that he was arrested and maybe he would be charged. I hope no phone call and come to, to, to stop that. Let me show you it one more time so you can understand what I'm saying. Let me bring in Mr. Conway. Mr. Conway, what are your views on that incident that we saw there? I, I totally agree with you, Paul. I don't know how I would have, would, have, would, have, would have operated. Normally, I'm a cool man, but I think I would have lost my cool. Now, if a man going to wind down a window and spit on a policeman, go back, sir. and spit on a, on a go back, sir. And spit on a, on, a, on a policeman in uniform, and then the, the man should have been made of what we call a public spectacle. He should have been in court, and he should have been spread all over the newspaper. Uh, that's when the 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 the, com the confusing communication unit should have gone into play. A man spitting on a policeman in uniform who carrying out his duties—that is craziness. That is craziness. And then the police, not not a word from the police. Not the word from the police, you know. He just should have thrown the whole, the whole book on him. And perhaps someday, if you had a, if you had a, carry out a proper examination on him, perhaps he might he, he, he might have he might have discovered that he got his, his, his license illegally and that kind of thing. A proper and thorough investigation should have been done on this guy's background. 
Yeah, I'm not, let me let me say this. Let me say this. Um, again, I say I don't condone violence or unprofessional behavior, but something like that. There is, there is provocation to the IS. You are on duty there as a police in uniform. Police on duty in uniform, traffic duties, and a man spit upon the police. Spit upon the police. I understand that he was arrested. I'm going to follow up to hear exactly um, what has happened um, in that matter. But I'm saying that I believe that the if um, I was in that man's position, the policeman position, I wouldn't forget whatever training I have about restraint. And um, he might have had to visit the dentist shortly thereafter because I am going to accept that even if it meant that I had to face departmental action, even if it meant that perhaps I, got, I would have had to lose the job, I believe I would have reacted instinctively and appropriately in my view. Well, I spit for the police. This thing upset me so much when I see it. And Mr. Conway is right. No statement from the police, no statement from the police um, association representing this rank or saying that behavior like this is unacceptable and would not be tolerated. Mass well, spit for the police. Mass well, spit on the police on duty. And, and nothing, no statement as, as yet. I understand that he's arrested. Again, I say, I understand that he was ar subsequently arrested. Let's wait to hear um, what will happen. Mr. Conway, you want to say anything more on this? Uh, no, I don't really want to go into it. But I'm saying that this, this is where the police should have really in, in breakneck speed take condign, con, 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 condign action against, against a person and I say, do a proper investigation on him. Sometimes, as, as I mentioned, sometimes he gave driver's license uh, illegally and all sort of things that could be done. That was an opportunity, you know, for the police to really take real, real, real condign action against that person there. Nonsense. A policeman in uniform, don't mind what the police do. The police might be going a bit overboard. But you can't spit on a policeman in, in, in uniform who's scared of the duty. No way, no way. No way, Jose, that should not be accepted. You want to talk about investigation too, Mr. Conway? I fully agree. And um, even with the accidents that you have, those fatal accidents, not only the cause of the accident should be investigated to determine culpability, but the old should be a more comprehensive investigation to find out if the person was licensed to drive, how the post, if the person was licensed, how they acquired that license. That is the type of information that you're going to gather which will inform the type of proper action that you will take um, going down the road. Not just investigate the accident, this body ran or this body jumped in the middle of the road or, 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 or that, but how did the person, was the person licensed driver? Go back to investigate how they acquired the license. And one of the accidents um, that occurred, I think two of them, they talk about it was at, at an intersection, the one at um, Brick Diamond Camp Street, where the light in one direction was flashing red and the light in the other direction was flashing amber. And the, once the lights are flashing, nobody ain't gonna right away. The, the lights are flashing, you have to proceed into the intersection in with caution. And apparently people don't know this, so the light flashing and they're zooming through. Because for a truck and a car to get involved in an accident at camp and uh, break down just a few, um, blocks from Brigdown Police Station, and it, when you see the extent of the damage on the vehicle, they have to be speeding. And as I've said, you're approaching the intersection, the light is flashing. Once the light is flashing, you have to slow, and nobody ain't going to right away at that stage, go into the intersection with caution. But all of these things are not taught, or even if they're taught, people forget about them when they get on the road. And that is the lawlessness we have uh, in the country. Let me show you some more. Let me tell you about some more lawlessness. More lawlessness. Pago Day. You know, Pago is a big celebration. And some people say, people in Alvaistown and certain of these um, traditional uh, black communities, they have bought over Pago. They celebrate Pago in those communities in a big way. So there is a video I'll show you in a short while. Where Pago in Alexander Village. I was a commander in a division. I can tell you, Pago and the Wali, those early days in uh, Alexander Villages are always a big thing. Lots of people celebrating, and uh, I don't know what happened, but it is stated 
that a man, get, let me give a joke, that a man in Alexander Village who is a PPP counselor, he's a PPP counselor, his name, the same name is David Williams, a.k.a. David Hype. They're saying that he brandished a firearm in front of many persons, including children, and fire around in the air. Let me show you the video. Let me show you, and then we're going to uh, explain a little later about it. Let me show you the, the video. Two short videos. Let me show you. Let me show you the next one, then we're going to go back. Let me show you about the other one. Yeah, according to what is being said, I don't want to misrepresent anything, but it was a pair based on what is very gentleman is saying that somebody may, may have blocked his entrance to his yard. You can see him there brandishing. Um, what appears to be a pistol and um, making nice. Then afterwards, he ran towards an area there shortly thereafter. What sounds like a gunshot um, is odd. But that is the type of lawlessness we have. They said this man is a PDPC counselor in, in, the, in the Georgetown City Council. So he brandishes the mere fact that he had that firearm walking around in a crowd there where we had children and other people. But hey, I as commander, because I understand that the police are taking action or he might have been detained. The first thing after detention and the seizing of the firearm should be a letter to him for him to show cause why the firearm license should not be revoked. And again, I say there's a process. Let me tell the squatter, let me tell the commanders, you can't just seize the fire. You seize the firearm as an exhibit, as part of the investigation. But you can't revoke the license just like that. You have to ask him to show cause, write to him, to him to show cause why the firearm should not be revoked. And in doing so, you have to state what the violation, that he brandished the firearm, he fired off or wrong indiscriminately. I don't know if they get statement from anyone in the area, but these things have to be stated. And once the, it is stated in the letter, then he's asked to show cause why the license in respect to this particular firearm should not be revoked and proceed with the appropriate action. All these people around, and this man walking about with a gun in his hand, powerful, because he's a PDP counselor, powerful walking around with a gun in his hand, and to make matter worse, he discharge around. Ah, he might have fired in the air, but you discharge around right away. You got several charges there. Apart from the brandishing, you get dis discharging within a certain distance from dwellings and all of that. That is lawlessness. And let's see what is going to happen. Let me hope that when the police take action, if they do take the appropriate action, and the appropriate action is not only charging him or putting him before the court, but the appropriate action too is to aim to show cause why the firearm license should not be revoked. Yeah, see, that's causing public terror, all of that. Because you can see from the video, when the shot went off, people duck and run. People in that yard duck. Obviously, they were fearful. So that is causing public terror. The firearm should be taken away at the beginning. You're not revoking it yet, but it is large at the station pending this investigation. And then you, you initiate the process to revoke the firearm. And let me tell you all four, as I said before, the DPP can determine whether you should be charged or not. But the DPP can't instruct or advise the police not to take away the firearm. Let's understand it clearly. I know they're going to say, oh, they're putting, there's everything now with the police. They're going to prepare a file. 
They sell it for legal advice and all of that. Right? That is what they're going to say. But let me tell you, you're going to send to legal, for legal advice to determine whether the person should be charged. And I'm saying again, a matter like this doesn't necessarily require legal advice. Once you get the evidence based on the video, based on statements, if you did a proper investigation, proceed to charge the man. But it's public terror, discharging his firearm within um, a, a distance of dwellings and all this other thing. Proceed to take away, start the process of revoking. And the DPP can't tell you not to revoke. She has no such authority. So understand this thing clearly. Let me bring in Mr. Conway to obviously on this. CC, your, your, your comments. Agree that it should be written to show cause why the firearm should not be revoked. But apart from that, Paul, just as like I mentioned with the, with the, with the, with the man who spat on the police to do investigation how we obtain his driver's license. This one, eh, it was a good case for them to see whether or not he had paid a, a million Michael plus to somebody in Shift Chandipal Drive, Young Street, a house in Rob Street, a building northwest of Brigham Police Station, to a doctor in Lamar Street, or or otherwise, that is when you should do a, a, a proper investigation. Even though you might open a can of worms, do it. It might lead you to a whole set of, whole set of, of, of illegal activities that, that, that took place, you know. So when you have when you have the opportunity to do sort of things, do it. But then they, they wouldn't want to do that. They want to do that. Sometimes he get he get it. He didn't get it through the the, the, the norm, normal means. And we as commander, we have had cases where persons committed their breaches, and then we discover hey, that they didn't get the the, the, the weapons through through the normal means, and we we we, we took action. That's what you gotta do. Do proper investigation. How did this man get 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 his get his firearm? Did he play a a, a 1.5 Michael or a one something Michael? And did he go to Shift Chandrapal Drive, Young Street? No, a house in Rob Street, a bill in Northwest in Brickdown Police Station, or a doctor in Lamar Street. All those things should be done. Whether you open a can of worms or not, do it, man. Do it in the interest of the public. Uh, I, I don't have to correct you, but I'll correct you this time. Can I say you might not have gotten it through the normal channel? I want you know it will appear now that that channel that you think is abnormal, perhaps that is the normal channel now. Eh? Perhaps that is the normal channel. Where rather than going to what you and I know to be the normal channel, then just pay the money and get whatever they have to get. But it's lawlessness. And let's wait to see what will happen again. This happened on Monday night. Today is Wednesday. This um, propaganda unit that love to give statements. You hear nothing about it yet. We haven't heard anything about it as yet. Right? So that is what happens in this space. But let me move on, man. Let me move on. Talking about lawlessness. Talking about investigation, then doing uh, um, you, you you're calling on them to investigate how this man might have acquired firearm and all of that, whether he went through the normal channel or where you went through those very those many places that you name. Now it brings me straight into this issue that has been percolating over the past week or so. When I refer to the um the Uni United Nations Human Rights Committee questioning the government of Guyana about several issues. They question about corruption. They question them about extrajudicial killing. They question them about the Environmental Protection Agency. They question about the treat, uh, treatment of media operatives and many, many, many more. And to, to see and to hear the lies coming out of the mouth of people like Gail Teixeira and the second vice president body is, is, is galling. These people have absolutely no shame and then here, the vice president, the second vice president. He wants the people to reveal who they got the information from. And then he blaming the opposition. It is the opposition furnished them with the information and the opposition responsible uh, for this. Let me say this. Let me say this in case they don't know, in case they just crawl out from under a rock. This information that the people question them about is there all over the media for the world to see so even if the information was furnished by um, opposition persons or other social media um, activists, the thing is public knowledge. Go and Google any one of these things. You're going to see it there. 
just, just do a little Google. And as the persons who are asking the questions repeatedly said, they have been able to verify. So they, they did not take these allegations at face value. They were able to verify. And what are the allegations? I got to get like Mr. C.N. Sharma. They're looking to see who are the alligators. They want to, instead of dealing with the facts of the matter. The first and perhaps the most egregious one is the Su Gate, where Su Jirang, a Chinese living in Guyana, was able to take this Vice News people who are undercover, Vice News, the American news outlet, into the living room of Vice President Barra Jack Deo, into his living room at Pradoville 2, and posed as businessmen trying to do business into his living room. And Sue there, and later on they released the, um, the the thing. The thing was released when it was it was released since 19th of June, 2022. This Vice News um, video was released 19th of June, 2022. And up to now, there has not been any investigation. And what was the allegation? The allegation was and is that the Vice President, um, according, according to Sue, according to what Sue said. And what the, the people were questioning about is that nothing gets done unless the vice president says so. And in order for him to sign off, you got to get 500,000 US um, dollars as a process of some, some fees they call it. That is there. No, there was no investigation, absolutely none. Such a serious allegation. And I say, in my lifetime, and I around over, um, over, over six decades now, pushing for me um, seven decade. I have never heard such a serious allegation made against any politician in Guyana. None. Never heard such a serious allegation. And what did they do? They did absolutely um, nothing. And so when this question is asked, Gail Teixeira said, oh, um, the, 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 yes, denied. So what you expect he can admit? We said very, very early in the game, this requires a credible investigation. Not by the police force, Guyana police force, a compromise unit. We said that in the interest of the vice president, if he is not guilty, he should have insisted that you have a credible investigation, FBI, um, the Scotland Yard, or some credible institution should come and conduct an investigation. Nothing, nada. And then when the people ask the question, oh, is the opposition and these people raising it? And if, again, the vice president, Jack Dio, Barrett Jack Dio, he likes to refer to people, especially Burke, as a, a, a known, known criminal. As far as I'm aware, Burke has not been convicted in any court of law for any um, crime. And let me, let me say this, let me preface by saying this, I am not representing Burke. Burke is good enough, to, and he has been doing a fantastic job in representing himself. But for the vice president of Guyana, the second vice president to sit there and call people criminal, people who have not been convicted for any offense. Because even if you are charged with an offense, there is a presumption of innocence until proven guilty by a competent court. So even if you're charged, you're not a criminal. But this is a man who has had serious allegation made against him. So if we're gonna use his yardstick to measure who is a criminal, then he's a criminal too. He, because allegations of a serious nature have been made against him. He's not charged. It was never investigated. But I'm saying he has been calling people who have not been charged criminals. So if we are going to use that, then he is a criminal too. So let me don't glass over it. So you had that, the Vice News thing. You want to tell me, um, as we have said, they could cover it up in Guyana. They could decide in Guyana we never investigate. But the international community would have seen that. The international community would have been made aware. All of those people, whether they're Americans, whether they're British, whether they're Europeans, whether they are, people would have seen that an allegation, a serious allegation has been made against a vice president. And when you're talking about investors, they are going to be told that as to anybody, any agency that would have briefed these people would have alluded to that. Not to say that it did occur, but to say that the allegation was made and therefore they have to be careful. They would have been cautioned. So I'm saying again 
that that wasn't investigated. That is one of the matters the people raised, right? And I said, no investigation. Another issue, another issue of corruption. Sergeant Dion Bascom made an allegation, I think it was last year, that he, this sergeant, was a member of the uh, major crime unit of the Ghana Police Force. And he made an allegation that the head of the major crime unit, Superintendent Caesar, accepted $30 million, Ghana dollars, from businessman Mohammed, Ashuddin Mohammed, to cover up the paper shot, regardless of Gundas, no less paper shot murder. That is an allegation that was made. And what happened? The police called a press conference shortly after to debunk the thing, which 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 um blew up blow it blowed up in their face. Well, in their faces because there's more than one of them. They went viciously after Boscom. Viciously. Right now he's before the court with several cybercrime um charges because the allegation was made on social media. Cybercrime charges. Uh, Mohammed sued him for I think 200 million or something like that uh, guy in the dollar. The matter, I understand, is working its way through the court. I think there was an um, hearing yesterday and it continues today. Right? They, they, you remember RSS, the RAS came in and they said that, okay, the police were capable of doing a proper investigation into this matter. The lawyer representing Bascom, Mr. Nigel Hughes, wrote to the president on more than one occasion requesting protection for Bascom, who was seen, who was deemed under the laws of Guyana to be a whistleblower. And what happened? Nothing. Nothing. Even though the law says that you should not take action, you can't charge a person um, who, has been, who is a whistleblower, they, they went ahead and they charge him both departmentally and um, cybercrime charges, which are working their way uh, through the code. That is what they do. And people will see these things. So don't, when you come and say, okay, the opposition report and social media influences report, but the thing is out there for all to see. It is there for all to see. These serious, serious allegations are there for all to see. There are some more, but before I go more, let me bring in Mr. Conway for him to say, um, well, maybe on the two that I've identified, that is the Suge and the Boscom uh, matter. Uh, Mr. Conway. Yeah. You know, I listen to both Tishiro and I listen regularly to the second vice president. And remember, he's not the first vice president. According to the Constitution, Mark Phillips, the prime minister, is the first vice president. But you only hear vice president, Jack Liu. And when you look at this trainer, you know, he's a Russian trained man. And they perhaps they indoctrinate certain things in him. The Russians had a saying, tell a lie, make it a big lie, repeat it often, and the whole world will believe in you. Tell a lie, make it a big lie, repeat it often, and the whole world will believe you. And perhaps Jack Dio has believed in, 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 in that thing. Perhaps that was indoctrinated in, in, in him. And when, when, when you listen to him, and you listen to, to Gail Tishiro, she blaming it on opposition. She going on and lying on, on the former head of the, that, 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 that unit there. You know, and they, 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 as, as you rightly said, Basco made serious allegations and they rush with breakneck speed to debunk. They made a horrible attempt to debunk. Maybe that's why they haven't hold any other press conference. Since, since since then, instead of listening to Boscombe, trying to find out whether he really is saying was the truth or not, they rush. Maybe they were protecting others. And I always like to refer to Sorpico, Frank Sorpico, who was a detective sergeant in the NYPD, and he made damning allegations against mem members of the NYPD, shook it to the bone shook it to the bone and instead of them debunking what he say they give him the opportunity to talk his story i think they had a naps commission that listened to him and he gave damn evidence there which which was true 
And I think we had a woman in, in, in New South Wales too, who brought down the, the most decorated cop, who, was a, who turned out to be a murderer, who turned out to be a drug pusher, who turned out to be a criminal. People could be, could be a criminal, you, 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 you could be a, a, a prostitute, but what to say you're saying, it could be the truth. And you must give me the opportunity, give them the opportunity to hear their story and listen to them. Just as how the United Nations, the Commission on Human Rights, they said they listen, they, they verify, they check, they double check and all kind of thing. That's why they could have asked certain questions, um, asked critical questions and get the people lying to, to, to cover up. The thing is, if, if persons make allegations, you should investigate. Don't jump to deny or, or, or jump to to, 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 um, you know, to to make them sound as though what they're telling is not the truth. Do proper investigation. And like you already said, I don't believe the guy in the police force could really investigate itself. And don't worry, the Ross report. The other report is imaginary. Anything they ever put up any report, imaginary. Get international people, get Scotland Yard, get FBI, get the, the Royal Canadian Mountain Police or other reputable international bodies to do proper investigation. Well said, but let me let me let me say this, you know, the talk about this um evidence. The the, the president and the second vice president and all said there's no evidence. But how are you gonna get evidence if you don't do an investigation? I have been taught that once an allegation is made. Right, credible allegation. You conduct an investigation, and this investigation is likely to unearth evidence. But they want to carry evidence to them. Is that is how it works? I don't know that that is how it works. A serious allegation is made, and you have to conduct an investigation. And and I say further that if you are innocent, as the vice president claims he is, then you should make sure that a credible investigation is done. Because unless a credible investigation is done, the stench of that allegation lingers and follows you every place you go. People in Guyana might turn up their nose and don't think about it, but the people in the national community and these international organizations, as we have seen, they have it on the radar. They have it there and they're asking questions about it. The United Nations Human Rights Body asking question about corruption allegation made against the vice president and guilty share to oh he denied it <laughs> i mean this thing is so laughable he denied so he denied what does that mean no investigation was done and i want to remind when i spoke of when we spoke about the paper shorts murder and the um, allegations made by the police sergeant that only recently a man known as the guyanese critics Mikhail Rodriguez, I think is his name, said, um, actually said exactly what Bascom um, said. In other words, he's accused the Mohammeds of being involved in paper shards murder. They're sued too. He is sued. Of course, they too deny. And as we say, they, you're innocent until proven guilty. Allegations are made. It requires an investigation to prove your innocence or your, well, the investigation is not going to prove anything. The, the to unearth evidence, because then has to go before a court or some tribunal to determine whether you are guilty or not. But that is what we have. That is what we have. And don't forget, they asked too about a permanent secretary at the Minister Ministry of Home Affairs, made to St. Thomas, who as permanent secretary was traveling through the U.S. to China, and she was detained um, for hours. I understand. Our phone was seized for weeks, got they sent it back eventually, and our visa was revoked. Imagine your permanent secretary, person who is the head of the Ministry of National Security, pulled in by the U.S. authorities. And what has happened? Nothing. Nothing. They reassigned her. They moved her from Ministry of Home Affairs to some other ministry. You think people are not looking into these things? You think people have not been fed with the information as to why they might have pulled her in and what they might have honored, um, honored, unearthed in that phone and all of that. They have the technology, they have the resources to do so. So they jump up. What that's such a serious thing. I remember the vice president said, oh, she was on PVP business. This is a 
person who is the head of the Ministry of National Security, the permanent secretary, because she's the administrative head. Any permanent secretary is the administrative head of the ministry. Seized, phone seized, arrested by the um, U.S. Border Patrol authorities. And what they, they, they are doing, basically, they did nothing in Guyana, nothing in Guyana. And the vice president said that the head, she was on PPP business. That is what he said. The head of the Ministry of Home Affairs, the administrative head, is on People's Progressive Party business. And I thought that the PSAs were supposed to be independent, were supposed to be neutral public servants. That is what you have. People will see these things. And when they ask, come in, you're going to tizzy and you make a lot of a nice. And then, they, 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 you, and then let me let me bring in here too. You think the people and see and hear that a senior police officer is alleged to have attempted to launder sixteen point five million dollars to the police credit union? These people have look. Let, let me tell you this: you, you got to be naive to believe that you have all of these high commissions and embassies here, and these people don't see this type of information and um, put it together and and, and brief the, the the people on it. A senior police officer is alleged to have um, attempted to launder $16.5 million to the police, credit, Guyana Police Force Credit Union. And what happened? So far, we're not aware that anything happened except that they transfer the ranks who um, said that the laws or the rules of the, uh, the credit union um, do not allow for that to happen. They move them. And I am advised that that is illegal because even though they are policemen, the credit union is under the laws of Guyana, is a financial institution. It has a board of directors that should be re responsible for the management. And no senior police officer, even though the ranks are police ranks, no senior police officer should be moving them uh, like that. There's a board of directors. But that's where you are. They moved them. They have moved them from the position. And I guess they're going to insert people who are going to go along with this illegal scheme. Let's wait and see. So you have that. And don't forget to, you get the Nigel Daram Lal matter. I remember the people talk about corruption, you know. And that, to me, is corruption as well. Nigel Daram Lal, the minister of local government, is alleged to have groomed, raped, and buggered a, a um, Amerindian girl, teenager. I think she had just passed 16 or something like that, at his residence in Georgetown. Compelling evidence, investigation done. The people visited the scene, the locals went back and visit and discovered, according to the um, young lady, that they had rearranged the place. They had rearranged the place. In other words, I said then that the only way they could have rearranged is because the young lady would have given a description of the inner part of the home, and that would have been communicated to Dharam Lal, no, by the police. And therefore, they move things around in an attempt to discredit her. So if she said there was a TV downstairs when you went back there to visit, no TV, say, oh, you said there's a TV, so you lie. That is what they attempted um, to do. That young lady was kept locked away. No access to liar, limited access to appearance, no telephone and all of that. And after all the pressure a file went to the DPP. For some inexplicable reason, the DPP returned the file for clarification when there was absolutely no need under the Sexual Offenses Act for, for the DPP to do so. And then the young lady said um, she doesn't want the matter to continue. And the DPP, our DPP said, or uh, let, me, let me put it right, the police said, the police reported that the DPP said that the girl, the victim, just 16 years plus age, determined that it was in our best interest for this matter not to continue. You want to tell me there's not corruption? And therefore, the DPP said no charge should be brought against Nigel Daramla. You think the world and see and hear about that? And that is there openly, what we call open source. Google it and you will see it. Nobody ain't got to go, no opposition member or no social media influencer have to tell them that. This will have staff. They have staff, competent staff, that is going to go through all of those things. And as the, as the people have said, they have been able to verify these allegations as being credible. 
So you have that, that the damn laughing. I don't forget to we talk about corruption. If you were questioning them, I don't think they question them about this one. But you remember the two hundred and fourteen million dollars in the Exxon Mobil auditing, where suddenly two hundred and fourteen million dollars reduced to three million. And what happened? They said that the man who did that was fined, I think, fifteen days pay, and he put on suspension. Even though he's an independent contractor, I understand. And he doesn't come under the public service rules, so there's no suspension or display. That is what happened. That those things are there for all to see, Mr. Jack Dio, Mr. Shearer. So to, to blame opposition elements and people like Slow and Conway, you're wasting your time. It's there for everyone to see. And and remember too, when we talk about this is Human Rights Committee, and when we talk about violation of the rights of persons, policemen. Have had their rights violated by the acting commissioner, the man who we refer to as the extended squatter. They have had their rights violated, their human rights violated. Uh, let me let me identify a few for you. You have when they following the Quinton Barker's murder, Damien McLennan, Christophe de Nabriga, Thorsten Simon were summarily the summarily dismissed on the 5th of July 2022, the same day they appeared in court. They were dismissed. They were not afforded the presumption of innocence as guaranteed under the Constitution. They are charged. They are dismissed. That's a violation of their human rights. The Constitution says that. And then later on, you had three constables. Let me, um, Shaquille Smith, Tariq McCallman, Donovan Walker, dismissed. Those were people in Barbies, New Amsterdam. The officer lost his firearm, and for some reason, they were dismissed and the officers still live out. Summarily, summarily, they were never charged with anything. They were never um, made to answer this charge. No disciplinary process, nothing at all. No presumption of innocence. The rule of law did not apply to them. They are dismissed from the force. And then you had a female special counsel, Kenesha Thomas. Same thing, dismissed summarily. All of those things are violation of the people's of those persons, human rights. And therefore, the human rights organization will see that. We'll see that. Let me begin Mr. Conway again at this stage. CC? Yeah, Paul. I you know, just, just getting back to the permanent secretary. Here is it, our visa was revoked by the U.S. And here it is that she was going or she went to China on PPP business when as you mentioned or as we all know this they, they, they they're supposed to be neutral but then the question is who paid for that passage who paid or, or for the accommodation and the other things did it come on the government funds or the, or the ppp funds those are questions that we need to ask and need to get questions but then getting back to the revocation of the visa it is well known it is well established that when the U.S. revoke your visa, they will tell you why they revoke it. They will tell you in person why it was revoked. The vice, the second vice president, is saying that the United States did not government did not report to this government why they revoke it. All you gotta do is ask the PS, ask her what I told you. Whether she might want to talk or not, and if she wants to be woman, she can say, "This is what they told me," but that is not that is not true. That is not the situation. You know? That they always tell you why they will revoke your visa. They don't tell the government. They tell you, the individual, and it's up to you, the individual, to decide whether or not you want to release that information. If she's not woman enough, release it. And then what? Well, she hasn't been performing properly at the Ministry of Home Affairs. So what they do? They sent she in labor. So she got into labor. Hope that they won't be a stillbirth, you know. And so many, so many different things, you know, so many areas of, of corruption going on in the place. It's, it's so so widespread, you know. If you even in the police force, Ben Ben mentioned about what I think. Uh, over 400 or 200 million um, dollars corruption in the police finance office. Then we had in the police quartermaster stores. 
all those things, so much irregularities going on. You know, if the, the recent reports that there are a lot of financial regularities going on with the people in the interior locations, with accounts, that people are being forced to put in bogus accounts. And they say one of the accounts going to help to build up back the, the welfare fund that they broke. You know, let somebody investigate what's going on with the interior locations. Fraud, fraud, and move forward. Corruption, corruption, and, and people turning a blind, blind eye to it. It is happening. Financial irregularity in the police force is widespread. And nobody in taking any action. And even you look at it, you know, the, the, the police force calls for four deputy commissioners of police. Four. We have one, Paul Williams. And, 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 and he's, he's, he's presently on pre-retirement leave. First thing they do, they, they, they send him to, to um, the COVID-19 secretariat. So you had a deputy commissioner there. You had an assistant commissioner there. You had a senior superintendent there. You had a superintendent there. Doing what? I, 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 I don't know. So they, they're not making any deputy commissioner. So they get, and I'm not bowling in the ball for, for those assistant commissioners. They get all as assistant commissioners masquerading as deputy commissioner. You're a deputy commissioner crime, deputy commissioner admin, deputy commissioner operation, deputy commissioner special branch. They are all assistant commissioner. And all the president has to do is have meaningful consultation with the leader of the opposition and the chairman of the police service commission and make those persons deputy commissioner. If they perform it so suddenly, why you can't make them deputy commissioner, but if you believe in divide and rule policy, put them against one another. They are carrying the same rank, so there is no unity. There is no, there is no, 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 no synergy, 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 synergy among them. And they're happy to say that they are deputy commissioner or acting deputy commissioner. It's only one deputy commissioner get, and there's Dr. Paul Williams. But the position is, get them there holding. Just like how you have the chief justice and the chancellor, and you can't make them conform. And then you the, the, the uh, gave to show of blaming it on, on, on the leader of the opposition. The leader of the opposition already said that he support those two women, those two honorable women to, to be chancellor. And, and, and Chief Justice. So, so much of things going on, you know, so much of corruption and the beauty people don't see. People, the United States has got the information and it get, 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 get it there readily available. I can remember a couple of years ago when my, when my visa to the States had expired and I, and I went, went there to get a visa. The consular officer said, I saw you travel regularly to the States. I said, yes, and I want to big up myself. Hear me. Yes, and I, I'm a graduate of the FBI. And he watched me smiling, said 99. He already had information there. There's, there's, there's get, and it was 99 that I graduate. So they already get the information there. Yeah, they already. But, they, you know, again, you made the point about the appointment or the non-appointment of the chancellor and the chief justice. And they asked, the, the, the United Nations body asked about that too. That is public information. Even the, the, the head of the Caribbean Court of Justice was very critical over the fact that these um, eminent women or ladies have not been confirmed for, don for donkey years. I think it's 17 years now you have not had a substantive um, chancellor or, or chief justice. So when they, and a year ago, they're blaming um, opposition for passing information. The people talk about extrajudicial killing too. And again, the, the records are there. Quindon Bacchus on the east coast of Demerara. Or in Boston in his bed on the Essequibo coast. Um, Peter Edley in his car, sitting in the front seat of the car, shot in the back. They say he reached under something with some gun. They, they, we understand the latest I uh, read about that is that an inquest was ordered. Up to now, uh, nothing. You had the case of Kevin Andrews on the east bank shot in his buttocks by the police. Or as the police will say in the release, it's Botox. B, they, they say Botox. What it takes, he shot in his buttocks. And there's only a, a few that, that we, we talk about. So when these questions are asked, the evidence is there. 
and you refer to you alluded to the Environmental Protection Agency, Dr. Adams, will get you to share when they are told a pack of lies. Pack of lies. How the man was responsible for the signing of this um, lopsided agreement and all that. The man was nowhere in the scene. And I, I compliment Dr. Adams for writing to the body and pointing this thing out to them. And I saw some news article that said, Gail Teixeira attempted to walk back. These people are pathological liars. And I understand that Vincent, um, Vincent Adams, Dr. Adams, uh, it indicated to her that he's going to take uh, legal action against her, as he should. You can't let these people jump and tell all this lie. A reputable man like Dr. Adams, highly qualified. And to get somebody like Gail Teixeira go in and tell a lot of lies about you, take it up, man. Take it up. And you had, of course, the, the question about the treatment of the uh, media workers. And they, them again, they come up with all sort of uh, thing. Oh, no, that is not so. But let me show you. I showed you before. This is, um look, this is Minister Ben interacting with the media workers. You 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 um, look at it and, and, and see. Is the next question. Next question. But what is the standard of Next question. Officer? Madam, I am not, I have when, not read the reports and I'm saying, you with the I am satisfied so far as to what was presented in the press, mm -hmm. that 88 rounds were fired at a car and they, nobody was injured, nor the car was struck. Does it bring into question the SOPs of the gun? The, the, I'm waiting for the review by the OPR and the commission police on that aspect of it. Yes. I'm not commenting further on the matter. But are the officers on the close? It is, it, it is uh, getting the attention of the OPR. But can you confirm if the officers are on the I'm not confirming the anything. I'm telling you, it's under the OPR. How are you the dealing with the rape? police? Who else has a question? Minister, are you Who else has a question? She has a question. Well, say it. Are you satisfied? Look, look at them as demeanor. And you want to tell me that um, the people are not going to see these things? Nobody got to tell them anything. No one has to report that. That is a minister of home affairs interacting with the media. And you can the hostility, the aggression in his voice. So uncouth, so unprofessional. And then the blaming when the people ask questions, they're saying all kind of... Um, craziness but people making report and all that. It is there for all of us to see. I'm talking, Mr. Conway spoke about the um, information and all of that. And it, it brings us to the next point. So you see, we had a recent visit by the director of the CIA, the director of the Central Intelligence Agency of America, recently visited Guyana. Um, re he recently visited Guyana. And speculation is rife as to what would have been the purpose. I don't know what the purpose was. But I can tell you from the little that I know that when the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, finds it necessary to visit a country, I could tell you, you have come for no coffee and scone. You have come for no um, Salara and Pintard. It must have been something serious. It must have been something of our very, very high security nature caused the director of the Central Intelligence Agency to leave, and remember, put this into um, um, the, the context, you get places like Gaza where people say a genocide taking place. You get other places in the world where people are being killed with impunity. The man did not go there. The man came to Guyana he came to Guyana to tell whoever he has to tell whatever he has to tell him. Mr. Conway, what is your take on that, my brother? It had to be a real, real, real significant visit. And he dealt with the president. I didn't see him dealing with the first, the second vice president or the first vice president that he dealt with the president. And then we're taking into consideration, Guyana is an oil-rich nation, the fastest developing economy in the world. And on top of that, we have the Venezuelan issue, where Maduro has not changed a word, has not changed a sentence. He had the something point plan that he put out since before the signing of Argyle, and even recently talking about making 
it's, it's, and they have taken over his cribble. He has, he, has, he has not changed anything. So perhaps all of that could have been, you know, in position because the U.S. is supporting us. And then to have a visit from the head of the CIA, and we know that the CIA been in Ghana since in the 60s, you know, we heard stories about since in the 60s, they, 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 were, they were in Guyana, supporting Guyana and all kind of things. So it's not, not, nothing's changed, but to have the head here, it is significant. Very significant indeed, very significant. Now, earlier someone asked a question about um, the Rick Ford Burke matter. Now, the update is, uh, remember Rick Ford Burke, the man who lives rent-free in Barajagdio's um, head? He, he, well, in recent times, he had stopped talking about uh, Burke. He went so far about talking about Rick Ford Burke, tight pants, and all that. When a man talking about another man's tight pants and so on, you have to be very, very suspicious. But what really happened, they sent a police officer from Guyana to serve a summons in the U.S. From Rick, to, on Rick Ford Burke. And then imagine legal people, including Guyana's attorney general, attempts to tell us that a policeman from Guyana can travel to the U.S. to serve a summons on a U.S. citizen. That is what they tried to tell us. Now, my understanding is that the summon um, had commanded him to report to court, COVID, not COVID, on vigilance, magistrate court on um, tomorrow's day, the 28th of March. But the new development is that Burke has moved to the high court through his lawyers, the um, senior counsel, Roysdale Ford, um, uh, uh, Don Ola Cush, and Sasha King. And uh, what it is what has been said, Rick Ford Burke seeks high court order against service of summons as his New York at, at his New York resident and defamation charges. It says U.S.-based Guyanese political activist Rick Ford Burke has asked the high court to throw out several defamation charges brought against him, as well as to declare the service of summons on him by the Guyana police force at his New York residence is to be illegal. Two his attorneys, Senior Counsel Raisel Ford, Don Adrian Cush, Don Ola Cush, and Sasha King, Mr. Bork is asking the high court to declare that the process of a magistrate, whether exercising civil or criminal jurisdiction under the Summary Jurisdiction Act, Summary Jurisdiction Magistrates Act, is restricted to the geographical limits of Guyana. Bork, who has been charged with conspiracy to publish defamatory libel, with a view to extort money, has repeatedly denied the allegation. In court papers seen by New Source, this is a New Source article, the activist is seeking a declaration that under the Constitution of Guyana, the defamation of a private person by another person cannot be regarded as a criminal offense. He also wants the court to declare that laws governing defamation and criminal defamation are in violation of Guyana's constitutionally enshrined fund <laughs> fundamental rights to freedom of expression. The respondents in the matter are Attorney General Anil Landlal and Magistrate Fabio Azor of the East Demrara Magisterial District. <coughs> Excuse me. Bork is alleging that the charges against him are political, mo politically motivated, fabricated, and unconstitutional. And the court here is saying they were fraudulently instituted against the applicant for the singular purpose of tarnishing his character and credibility as an ardent critic of the PPPC government of Guyana in the US and the international community. And because the applicant exerts tremendous influence among persons in the US government and on social media, Mark Chu's attorney said, he believes he has been targeted by the current government over his regular public criticism and rebuke of the government and many other actions. So Bork moved to the court. And note here, they say that Bork has uh, repeatedly denied the allegation. Barak Jagdu has repeatedly, repeatedly denied the Sugate allegation as well. People have a right to deny the allegation, but that is the update. And let me tell you further, I am anxiously waiting to follow this matter because this is a case where Bork is accused, and I'm reading it to you from the complaint without oath. The statement of offense, and let me let me go further. It says this is in the this is a complaint without oath 
in the Georgetown Magistrate District, Georgetown Magistrate's Court. The police sergeant who filed the charge, his name is there, I won't mention his name, of the Criminal Investigation Department, the squatters, is the complainant. Rick Ford Burke, male African descent, 49 years old, a consultant, resides at Fellowship on the east coast of Demerara. Hear what I say. Bork resides at Fellowship on the east coast of Demerara. He's the defendant. And hear what the statement of the offense is. Using a computer to humiliate a person contrary to Section 195A of the Cybercrime Act 2018, Act Number 16 of 2018. That is this um, statement. And hear what the particulars of the charge are. It says the defendant on the 25th day of November 2022 at 205 Camp Street, North Cummingsburg, Georgetown, in the Georgetown Madisil District, use a computer system to disseminate information knowing same to be false that subject that subjected Kwame McCoy to public ridicule, contempt, hatred, and embarrassment. That is what it says. But a lot of things wrong here. The Sarima live in the um, friendship. That's the address they gave. They're claiming that this offense is a left stuff taking place at 205 Camp Street, North Cummingsburg. And I asked the question before, if it's an offense in the Georgetown Madison District, how come you're filing, uh, you're applying for summons in the East Demerara Madison District? He lives there. According to you, he lives at, um, at at Fellowship on the East Coast. That is somewhere by Buxton. But as I know it, it is not where the person lives. It is where the offense is left of committed. Is the left of being committed? That is where the jurisdiction lies. So in this case, if you're saying that it's um, two or five camp sheet, um, not Cummingsburg, then the the offense is the left of being committed in the George Chugman Steel District. And for your information. 205 dot um, camp sheet dot is what we used to know what was known as call grain house call grain house is a place just north of um christchurch that bondong and just west of um Georgetown club call grain house the 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 caricom secretary general used to live there that now houses the office of the prime minister call grain house 205 Camp Street, North Cummingsburg, is the address of the Prime Minister's office. So this offense is alleged to have been committed at the Prime Minister's office. But they're going to give you all the information. But that is what is... And then, you know, for, for the, the, um, the second vice president, oh, this has nothing to do with cybercrime. All the charges that were filed against um, Burke were under the cybercrime act. Three or four charges, all of them. And for Jack Dio to tell people it is not so, it is extortion and all of that. You accused of taking five hundred thousand dollar bribe. You refer to Bork as a criminal. And I say I am not defending Bork. I am I don't know brief for Bork. Bork has been doing an excellent job of defending himself. But I I feel offended as a citizen that the second vice president will be calling a a, a person a criminal who has not even been to court on a, 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 a case. And I say again. That if we're going to use that yardstick to measure a criminal, then the vice president, Barra Jack, is also a criminal because serious allegations have been made against him. So if you want to say if an allegation is made against a person, he's a criminal, then Mr. Jack Dio, we're going to use the same yardstick and say you're a criminal too. And many others who have had allegations made against them. But that is what we have. That is what we have. And then they're going to come after you with cybercrime charges. The same cybercrime law that the Attorney General Anil Landala said some time ago will be repealed and be replaced with a more modern thing. They have weaponized it. They have weaponized it to go against people when they talk. And what the lawyer is saying there is the correct thing. If, you, if, if a person defames you, then let the person sue. If I defame a person, sue them again to court. But to be weaponizing the cybercrime act, uh, in the manner that they are doing, is wrong, it's unconstitutional. It's unconstitutional. And I am waiting to hear what the court will say. Somebody asked him, where's, where's Sue? They said, the, um, Sue was served. Mr. Jack Dio, the vice president, Sue Sue for $50 million, I think it was. And he said, 
Later on, they said, Sue was served. So I asked the question, was it personal service? Because since Vice News broke this story, Sue has disappeared. Sue has disappeared. And I think recently, the vice president is reported to have said, oh, they're going to default judgment. Meaning that if Sue does not turn up to defend himself, they're going to ask for default judgment, similar to what was granted against Jack Deal in the Annette Ferguson case. When he did not represent, the, um, he did not file a defense, and a default judgment was entered. He carried away all the things to the CCJ, and the CCJ basically said, all right, let us hear the matter on its merit. That is what $25 million, I think it was, or $20 million for Ferguson. And he dancing and he dancing. But you have more coming. Kaigan and uh, Gulseran and um, Sue as well. Let me bring Mr. Conway to wrap up. CC, what, what, what's this whole thing? Let me hear your views, my brother. And give you a wrap. <laughs> All right, no, no, you see, the thing is that they, they could take um, Sarabu and send him to New York to serve the documents on, on Bork. And right in New Amsterdam, there is a interdiction letter there for a police corporal. He named Bork, he named Sigobin to be served on him and is there for over a week. Perhaps the man in charge here has no respect for the extended squatter. And the thing is that you, it's not servant Sigobin, but perhaps they're waiting for maybe the, 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 the order to be rescinded. And I won't be surprised if before long you hear that the DPP has not processed that matter, or that the victim is saying, hey, we don't want no further police action into this matter. All sort of thing going wrong. All sort of corruption going on in the place, Paul. And so the, the bug matter is very, very in, in, in interesting. And for me, they have no real legal basis in which to serve any summons on, 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 on Bork. And they hold the old process wrong. If you look at the particular offense, this thing committed in the Prime Minister's office, you know, they, 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 they all, the whole thing is making a, a mockery of the judicial process in the end. It's, it's making a mockery of the process indeed. It's making a mockery. But you know, this is an interesting matter. And I, as I've said, I want to see how the court will rule. Because if the court rules that a policeman in Guyana can jump on a plane and go to America or by extension any other country and serve a summons or any other legal process. That is, that, that's gonna be an earth shattering um, development. That's a whole paradigm shift. If the court were to so rule, and I don't think the, 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 any court can rule that a policeman in Guyana can jump on a plane. Can you know the vice president said this is what they should do. Um, sue them. He said, you know, got, uh, apply for summons and get some process server in the thing to solve. That's what the vice president said. But you know, the vice president says a lot of stupidness, as I would say. Uh, uh, and that's stupidness. Kochima, a lot of stupidness. And, uh, and you know, Kochima, we get a lot of saying. We get a lot of saying. And one of the sayings we say in the country is that if your mouth sh shaped like Bati, you got to shit. You got to shoot shit. Country man, they want to sell you in the country there. If you're mouth shaped like Batty, you got to shoot shit. So there's a lot of nonsense. And unfortunately, a lot of people listen to those things and believe it. That a policeman in Guyana can jump on a plane, travel to the U.S. without the involvement of the U.S. authorities, get some process server, a disreputable one at that in the U.S., and go and solve a process, whether it's a summons or any other process, on a citizen in the U.S., that is what they argue. And as I've said before, people who don't have legal training, we could understand. But when it's the, your attorney general and other people who are supposed to have gone through uh, legal training, making such a, a claim, that tells you how ridiculous and where we really are. And no wonder, recently the Chief Justice of Barbados 
had to make some remarks about the quality of the liars now coming out from um, the produced in the Caribbean. You yeah, must read it. The man made some very scathing remarks about the quality of the liars. And he was not only referring to our COVID liars, not only our COVID liars, the man said the quality poor. And I can attest to that. I can attest because when we were in court uh, recently with this trumped up conspiracy to commit fraud, when you hear liars, the liar representing um, so called them, pray the nonsense they're advancing and the foolish argument they, 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 they're making, they want to know what's really going on. And in closing, I want to, two things I want to talk about. The first one, perhaps we're going to address it a little bit more in the next program. We would have seen that the Guyana government intends to recruit 500 Bangladeshi nurses to support the health system in Guyana. 500 nurses from Bangladesh. And you know, the thing come out on the social media, and then it forced the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to come with some stupid statements. Say, oh, it's not only Bangladesh they're going to recruit from, they're going to recruit from elsewhere as well. But the, the, the letter or the agreement that is circulating speaks about recruiting. They, they, they hired a firm to recruit 500 nurses from Bangladesh to serve um, in Guyana. And the, last, the next one I want to tell you about is this macabre um, incident at Rosignal. I don't know if you saw it, where a man died and was buried. And days after the man was buried, Tomb Raiders broke into his tomb, cut off the dead man's head and put it on the tomb and ransacked the, 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 the coffin there. And they said they stole some amount of money. Like there was, he put a little money in the coffin for the man, spent on the other side. That is what is reported. The recent, the most recent report is that they, um, they arrested two fishermen and uh, to, to, to charge. It's madness in this place. Macabre. Break into a tomb, cut off the dead man head, put the dead man head on the, on, the, on the top of the tomb, and ransack the man. Even You can't even rest in peace when you're dead in this place. That is what um, transpired. And then the last one, too, to update you, I reported, I think it was Monday, on the death of um, Mr. Moses Elias, their teacher, who lived at Lot 1, Kwamina Road, better for walking, fired, the, the house was burned down, and he died. Now, it has been reported by the police and the, the place there that the man himself set the place on fire. The people are saying that when the police broke into the bottom flat, they saw him going upstairs with a container supposed to contain gasoline, and he doused it on our chest, and he set it on fire, and he called out to say, um, this, this place too hard, life too hard, or something like that. So they are suggesting that the man committed suicide. Balling out 84 years old that the place uh, times too hard or something to that effect. Times too hard. So 84 years old man decide um, he can't take it no more and he killed himself. That is what is happening. This place tough. And let me tell you, they say, GSK Lal says, what we have today is not a government, but a gang of gangsters for the most part. What Guyanese have for leaders today are nothing but out-of-control lunatics, pathological liars, unreconstructed racists, and political sadists. The UNHCR exposed all this and more in one fell swoop. Unless stop, the PPP government will drown Guyana with it, with it, with it as its long descent begins. That is what Gage, um, GSK Lal said. And I believe that sincerely, right? That is what I bring it up here and I show you all and remind you all uh, about it. So, folks, we have come to the end of today's program. Good Friday is Friday. I wish all you, all my Christian brothers, I know the end the, is going to be the end of the, of the Lenten season. Um, so, those of you who have been fasting and observing the Lent, don't overdo on that day. Don't overdo at the end of the Lenten season. Um, Monday is um, Easter Monday. Uh, Easter is really Sunday. But Monday is Easter Monday. You fly your kites, do so in safe areas. Be safe, my um, folks. You saw the accidents that we told you about. Many, many accidents around the place. You have to be extremely safe. And with Easter, with kite flying, be careful with those electricity wires. With the electric wires, be careful that your kite don't become entangled and you, and you um, 
electrocute yourself. Be extremely, extremely careful. I know it's someone is a big picnic day um, in Guyana. All the open spaces, people are going to be there. Good. Enjoy yourself, but be extra, extra careful. And Monday being um, Easter Monday, I wish to let you know that we have to enjoy our Easter as well. And therefore, we are not going to have any program on Monday. Our next program will be on Wednesday. So actually, this program today is the last program in March 2024. We're going to have the next program on Wednesday. And we will see if we can do a makeup later in the week. You know, we did that before. So we're not going to have any program Monday. We're going to come again on Wednesday, um, which is going to be the first program in April. And we're going to try to make it up uh, with you. Once we have information to pass on, we're going to come and we are going to make it up with you. So until then, I encourage you to stay well and uh, be safe. Be safe and stay well. Until we meet again, God's willing, God's willing, we'll meet again next Wednesday. Until then, bye.